Okay. Um, so roll call first. Um, Audubon, Florida. Yes, Mark Rochelle is here. Great, thanks Mark. Um, Friends of Hillsborough River. Sierra Club. Here, here. The Tampa Bay Conservancy. I just moved it along. Tampa, Tampa Bay Waterkeeper. Uh, Tampa Bay Watch. Good morning, Peter Clark's here. Hi, Peter. Melanie Grillon also here. Okay. Um, commercial fishing. Present, DJ Strutt. Great, thanks, DJ. Um, and then we have environmental consulting, Wood. Yeah, I'm here. Kevin Shelton, thank you. Um, Gulf Stream Natural Gas. Okay, Tampa Bay Pilots Association. Hi. Okay, Mosaic. Yes, we're here. Great. Uh, Tampa Electric Company, Tico. Yes, Amy Butler is here. Great, thanks. Um, and then IFAS, C. Grant. Yep, Libby Carnahan is here, representing UF IFAS Extension, Florida C. Grant. Great, thanks, Libby. Um, and then USF. Yeah, Mark Luther here from USF Marine Science. Thanks, Mark. Um, University of Tampa. Aaron Brown. Okay. Um, Eckerd College. Amy Sweeta here. Thanks, Amy. Um, and then Egmont Key Alliance. Okay. Um, and then we have an elected from Hillsboro. I believe I saw uh, Commissioner White wouldn't be on, on, but maybe his his alternate is Megan. No, okay. Um, and then staff. I'm, here, I'm sorry. Oh, oh, hey Megan. She is here. Okay. <laughs> um, and then uh, staff from Hillsboro. David Glicksburg with uh, Hillsborough County Public Utilities. Good morning. Thanks. David. Good morning, David. Um, and then we have a staff from Manatee. Yeah, hi, Greg Blanchard's here. Rob Brown's here. Good. Thanks. Um, and then an elected from Pasco, Commissioner Oakley. He's not able to attend today. Okay. Um, and then staff from Pasco. That's me, I'm Renee Brown, Natural Resources Manager. Thanks, Renee. Um, and then an elected from Pinellas. Charlie Justice here. Thanks, Commissioner Justice. Um, and then a staff from Pinellas. Charlie can handle it on his own. <laughs> Be Melanie Reed or Stacy Day. I was just gonna say Libby Carnahan. I can also um, relate. I'm also Pinellas County staff if I need to double tap. Good. Okay, um, and then the Port of Tampa Bay. Okay, Port of St. Petersburg. David Worth for Port of St. Pete here. Thanks, David. Um, and then Manatee Port Authority. George Eisenmenger here. Thanks, George. Um, and then uh, someone from St. Petersburg, staff. I can double as that as well. Okay. So Michael Perry. Ellie Thomas. 
Kelly Thomas is on. Um, I'm at the city of St. Petersburg. I'm not sure if Mike's on the, on the line or though. Okay, great, thanks. And then um, Tampa. Hello, I'm Heather Maggio with the city of Tampa. And Heather. Um, and then Clear Clearwater. Okay, and then our chair. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. And then our vice chair. Chair as well, thank you. Thanks. That's Woody. Okay. And then we have the, um, the US Army Corps of Engineers. Okay, and then uh, USGS. Yeah, good morning, Kevin Grimsley's here. Good morning. And then Noah. Yes, good morning, Mark Schramick. Thank you. And then we have the DEP. Good morning. Yes, it's Shannon Herbin. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and then we have uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Yes, good morning. Brad Furman. Center out for Jason Wagman. Hi. Um, great. And then FWRI. Brad Furman. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Thank you. Um, and then the Department of Transportation. Good morning, this is Allison Connor in the Environmental Management Office. Great, thank you. And then SWIFMUD. Morning, everybody. This is Chris Anastasio, SWIFMUD SWIM program. Great, thanks. Um, and then we are missing a few at-large members, but um, we do have one for Pinellas. Uh, so our at-large member for Pinellas. The George Henderson. Yep. Great, thanks, George. And then we have EPC of Hillsborough. Hi, Chris Pratt here for Tom Ash. Great, thanks. Um, and then the Hillsborough County City County Planning Commission. Sean College here with the Hillsborough County Planning Commission. Thanks, Sean. Um, and then we have the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Good morning, Ed Truitt here. Thanks, Ed. Um, and then the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service. Good morning. Good morning. Tiffany. Hi, Tiffany. Um, and then McDill Air Force. Yeah, good morning. This is Andy Likens representing McDill. Thanks, Andy. Good morning, and Andy. Tampa Bay Water. Good morning, Warren Hogg. Tampa Bay Water's here. Or is it? Okay. Well, it seems like we have a quorum. Um, I I don't know if you called Tampa Bay Conservancy, but this is Sally Thompson. Yeah, I did. Thanks, Sally. Okay. And this is Randy Ronald, Tampa Bay Aquatic Preserves. Oh, I'm glad you got on, Randy. Are you in the parking lot? Yeah, I'm about to load up on the boat here. So. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, we appreciate your efforts to connect with us. Okay. Um, you know, this is quite an impressive group. When you read that list, Alana. You know, that's the best of the Tampa Bay region, in my opinion. Um, do we have any public comment before we get into our meeting? Anybody who joined us that would like to say something? All righty, then um, do we have any announcements? Lana, are you aware of anything? Do any of you in your groups have anything you would like to share with the others as to what your group that you are doing uh, that you would like to make public? All right, hearing no one, we'll move on to the approval of our minutes on March 11th. Have you all had an opportunity to read them? I think they were attached to your meeting agenda that was online. Is there... Um, a motion to approve. Come on, don't be shrinking violets here. <laughs> Somebody give me a motion. Move approval, Woody Brown. Thank you, Woody. Is there a second? Second, David Glicksburg. Thank you. Motion second to approve. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Okay. Thank you. And we'll move on then. We've got some um, updates from Alana. Share of the oh, who was that, Aaron? Did you have something to say, Aaron? 
she is, but I can't hear it. Oh, okay. Um, Alana? Alana? One second, yep, I'm gonna start sharing my screen. You know what, guys, I'm gonna be glad when we, we meet in person. I think our next meeting, we're gonna have both person and then hybrid for those who can't make it. Isn't that right, Alana? Yeah. Yeah. We're gonna try and do that, yep. Okay, are you ready to update us? Yes, and let me just start the presentation. Okay, do you see um, the full presentation? You don't see the, the presentation mode, do you? Or the what I see with like the speaker notes in the next slide? No, it's, it's the up. presenters for you. It's there. I'm seeing the notes. You're seeing the notes as well. Yeah. yeah. Oh no. Your PowerPoint's all along the bottom. Oh, displays. Is that is that better? There we go. You got it. Yeah, that's better. Perfect. Okay. Great. Well, um, I just wanted to give um, some updates regarding our, our last meeting and so, some of the progress we've made. But before I jump into that, just some general housekeeping related to Zoom. Um, we would prefer if you kept yourself muted, um, unless you have a question to ask or something to say. Um, and then and you can do that by clicking, um, there's an icon at the very bottom, mute. Um, and then at the very top, you can change the view of, um, so you can either go from gallery or to speaker mode, and, and that's kind of up to you. Um, when we're in discussion, I would suggest going into the gallery mode so you can see everyone. Um, and then if you have any other additional comments or questions, you can feel free to drop that into the um, chat. And then obviously there's the raise hand function as well if, if you wanna speak up, um, and I'll make sure to call on you. So, um, if you have any questions, you know, feel free to, to ask me privately in the, in the chat as well. I'm, I'm happy to help you figure out any technical difficulties. Um, so um, I'm just going to give a, a quick overview of um, sort of the membership status and what um, empty slots we have, um, and then give you the results of the prioritization that we did in the last meeting with the CCMP activities. Um, I will share some of the progress we've made regarding uh, red tide coordination and then um, progress we've made regarding the terrapin conservation as well. So first, um, I just want to say a big thank you to everyone for um, coordinating with me and getting your member forms in. That, that really helps to just make sure we keep track of, of who's currently serving on the ABM. Um, I don't have every membership space filled. Uh, so these are the ones that are still remaining. Um, and then I'll be working, you know, over the next few months before the, our next meeting to try and get as many of these um, filled as possible. So if you have suggestions of, you know, who could serve in one of these places, then please, please send me an email um, and then I'll reach out to them. Um, Okay, so in the last meeting, if you recall, we uh, did some prioritization of the activities that were assigned to the ABM and the Comprehensive Conservation and Management Plan for Tampa Bay. Um, and so I, I believe it was a little under 40 people who participated in this, um, and I just wanted to give um, the results of that prioritization. And so why this is important, um, these activities, so not only were they assigned to the ABM, but it will really help me to pick presentations and, and topics for, for future meetings that help us to fulfill these activities that were assigned to us. Um, so the one that ranked highest for the full agency activities um, was, uh, to improve the coordination among agencies and organizations involved in um, some the flood control, habitat protection, and water quality improvements to facilitate tidal tributaries restoration that support the comprehensive uh, management goals. And then the one that ranked second um, was uh, to support education, outreach, and enforcement to reduce user conflicts among some competing uses within the Bay. Um, and then third was to deliver targeted messages via diverse methods uh, to diverse audiences through communication tools and, um, you know, sharing any lessons learned through that. And then the last one was to increase engagement between the U.S. Um, Coast Guard, spill responders, and the environmental community. So the activities for our legislative review subcommittee, um, the one that ranked highest in the prioritization, um, 
was to support legislation at local, uh, state or federal levels to require regular maintenance and inspection of septic systems. Um, and then the second was to form a task force of interested bay managers, um, bay users and others within the ABM to develop and implement a strategy to achieve any um, funding for, for on water enforcement. Um, and then, by the way, this presentation will be online. So if you wanna go back and review these activities, you're, you're more than welcome to. I'm just gonna highlight um, some of them. Um, and then so for our Natural Resources and Environmental Impact Review Subcommittee, the activity assigned to ABM, which ranked highest, was to improve and expand upon the coordination for regional review of development and restoration projects that may impact federally designated essential fish habitat in Tampa Bay. Um, and then the second that uh, ranked highest was um, exploring regulatory rule revisions to address the current disincentive for replacing existing seawalls um, and expedite regulatory permitting for living shorelines. So um, those are just some highlights of, of the top activities. And then um, if you recall in the last meeting, um, we had a presentation from Jennifer Schaefer um, regarding this new report that was released um, about the red tide response um, from the 2018 red tide event. Um, and so following that, uh, we sort of took the recommendations and um, we convened a meeting on May 25th with um, the natural resource managers and emergency response coordinators from each of the counties within that report. So Pasco, Pinellas, Hillsborough, Manatee, and Sarasota counties. Um, and then some additional stakeholders like um, the Tampa Bay Estuary Program was there. So it was the Sarasota Bay Estuary Program, the Department of Health, um, the Department of Environmental Protection was there, and several others. Um, and so we got everyone together to start talking about um, regional coordination for, for Red Tide. Um, and I'm sure many of you saw in the news that um, they're starting to measure red tide you know, in Pinellas County. So it's really important that we get this work going and, and TB, TBRPC is, is in a perfect position to sort of help with this regional coordination and, and response. Um, so during that meeting, we, uh, the counties each shared their uh, efforts in that 2018 event. Um, and then we all, all worked together to prioritize the recommendations from Jennifer's report that she presented on. Um, and so at the end, we, we sort of identified four key areas of action um, or deliverables. Um, the first being the data management tool and regional SOPs. So we need some kind of regionally standardized data collection um, and a regional tool would be really helpful for data reporting and then assessing any conditions and um, tracking staff time. Um, and maybe something that could be, you know, each of the counties could tap into it and use. Um, and then maybe there would be even some kind of a public interface as well. Um, and then another was everyone really prioritized the need um, to create some kind of a process or guidelines for the state to declare a state of emergency, um, which would help activate some funds for the cleanup. Um, and that's a little less clear cut. Um, we still need to figure out how that will work, um, but it's something that we'll keep working on. Um, and then we um, also see the need for a means to share resources among the counties. Um, and so we talked about maybe creating some kind of an MOU for that. Um, and that's something that we could get started on pretty soon with, with the TBRPC. Um, and then the last is the need for public education and outreach around uh, Red Tide, the causes of it, and, and um, you know, connecting people to the data so they can see what's going on in their area. Um, and then at, towards the end of the meeting, um, we all identified the need to keep meeting and, and everyone's really interested in meeting quarterly. So, um, you know, I'll, I'll set up the, the next one for, you know, in a few months. But um, in between that, I think it would be important to have individual meetings um, for each of these. Uh, and then whomever wants to take part in developing those can join. So um, that's sort of the progress we've made on the red tide front, um, and we hope to continue this, this progress. And then um, we also saw a presentation from George Heinrich, um, and he's with the Florida Turtle Conservation Trust. He gave us an overview of the conservation status of the Diamondback Terrapin. Um, and so this resolution supports the FWC regarding their efforts to require bycatch reduction devices on all recreational crab pots um, and the implementation of Terrapin bycatch reduction zones. 
um, which would require the use of those bycatch reduction devices for commercial crab pots in Tampa Bay. Um, and so it was. In, this is included on the TBRPC agenda for Monday. Um, and we find that the timing of this issue is really critical. So that's why we put it on the June council meeting. We don't have a meeting in July. Um, so we anticipate it will be passed, but um, I would welcome any kind of feedback on this. If there's anything you would like to include, I, you know, I, I welcome you to speak up. Um, and so, yeah, again, the council will vote on Monday. Um, and the last little bit that I had to, to review with you all, I have been sending out notifications for the email or for the meeting via constant contact, but I know not everyone, um, you know, they firewalls or something that prevents them from getting our messages. Just please let me know so I can make sure that you are getting not notifications about the meetings and, and you know to attend. Um, so if you didn't receive your, um, for, for the members, if, if you didn't receive my email notifications, then please contact me and, you know, I'll make sure to send you maybe a personalized email, um, not using constant contact. And then for non-members, um, you can sign up to receive meeting notices and agendas at our website. So it's just tbrpc.org slash ABM. And if you scroll down, you'll see this button here, join the agency on Bay Management email list. And you'll just wanna click that and then it will automatically put you on our distribution list. Um, so those were the updates that I had for, for you all. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Very well done. How about some questions? Anybody have any input or ideas they want to suggest? Well, I'm really happy to see the um, red tide thing moving along. Yeah, Going Barbara, to Barbara Sheen. Uh, go ahead. Um, I don't have all the information in front of me, but I just wanted to share that uh, my colleague, uh, Betty Stogler, who was our Charlotte County Sea Grant agent, uh, mm -hmm. wrote a grant for a position for herself. And so now she has a new position um, in harmful algal bloom communications coordination. So I'll be sure to uh, connect her and Alana and so that ABM can stay in the loop on any work that she's doing in that new position. That's wonderful. And the statewide position, but I think it has, you know, national, uh, a national platform as well. That's incredible. Well, Listen, one thing when we were preparing for this meeting um, is, is I personally, as a lay person who's very supportive of the issues and the priorities for this agency, I'm impressed with the diversity that we have here. And I hope for the rest of the meeting, as we get into these topics that are being presented to us, and then when you have time to put other ideas in, that each of you will uh, feel free to ask questions. I know at one point we're gonna actually have a panel talking about one of our presentations and Libby having your colleague keep in touch with us. That, that'll be very, very helpful. We appreciate that. Okay, so I guess- Are there, um, yes. are there any other questions before we move on? I just wanna make sure that- Yeah. Anything else on the presentation that she did? All right, then um, looking at our agenda, we have, uh, Chris is going to give us a Tampa Bay seagrass mapping. Uh, I guess you're gonna give us, Chrissy, update as to where we are and what you've accomplished so far. Yeah, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, present you guys with the final results from our 2020 seagrass mapping for Tampa Bay. Okay, thank you, Chris. Yeah. And Barbara, you can can you hear me okay? I can hear you fine. Can everyone right, else? Perfect. I'll, yeah. I will warn everybody. Um, I'm in my screen porch office this morning, so my neighbor has a peacock. So if you hear some strange sound like somebody <laughs> strangling a cat, that's the peacock in the background. So <laughs> just war fair just warning. Just accompanying your presentation. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, Barbara, do you want me to go ahead and share my screen, or do you want to uh, do it from there? Yeah, go Chris, ahead. Chris, I made you a co-host so you can share your screen. Okay, perfect. And uh, let's see, I'll go ahead and share it and let me know if uh, you guys can see the title screen or the... Uh, yes. You can, okay, perfect. So we'll go ahead and put that in presentation mode. Uh, you guys are probably seeing the uh, presentation screen, aren't you? 
Let yeah, if you see. go to the top um, swap displays, at least that's how it is online. Yeah, how's that? Um, push the swap presenter view and oh, there you go. That's perfect. Is that good? Yeah. That's good. All right. Great. Awesome. Okay. Well, well, great. Um, I'm glad that uh, I'm able to present this to you all today. Uh, what I'm going to do again is give you kind of a, a, a high level overview of the uh, results from our latest seagrass mapping for Tampa Bay. Uh, before I do that, though, I just want to kind of give you guys a, a quick overview of the, the seagrass mapping program that we have at the district. So we've been mapping grass um, along the west coast of Florida since about 1988. Um, we, we kind of break it up into two regions. We have the Springs Coast region to the north, which is roughly from Anclo Key up to Wakasasa Bay, close to uh, Cedar Key. And then from Tampa Bay south is what we call the, the, the Sun Coast, which goes down to Charlotte Harbor. Um, we map the Sun Coast region from Tampa Bay to Charlotte Harbor on a two-year cycle, and the Springs Coast is on a four-year cycle. And there's there's kind of three um, phases, if you will, to our seagrass mapping program. Obviously, there's the acquisition phase, which is uh, where we acquire the imagery by which we make the maps. Um, there's the photo interpretation phase, which is the actual creation of the map. And then kind of the, the thing that goes through the whole process is the field verification. And that's a really important piece of uh, what we do in order to create as accurate a, a map as we can. And, and I'll talk about each one of these individually. So with respect to the acquisition, um, our flight window when we fly uh, to collect the imagery is between November and February. And there's a lot of reasons why we do it at that time of the year. It's not biologically speaking optimal because seagrass are, are they, they kind of go dormant and often senesce over the winter. Um, the height of the growing season really is September, October timeframe. But the reason why we do it November to February uh, has a lot to do with the weather conditions. So we have a very strict set of go, no go criteria for flight. Um, a lot of that has to do with weather. So we have to have clear skies, we have to have uh, low winds, um, preferably no clouds and the tides have to be just right. We also have to have clear water because again, we're, we're taking pictures of stuff that's under the water column. So um, clarity is really important. And we have a kind of a guideline of a minimum Secchi disc depth of about two meters. So around six feet is, is optimal for us to go ahead and give the thumbs up to go ahead and fly. And um, the way we do that is we actually collect Secchi discs throughout that flight window period, or at least until we complete the acquisition. And we couldn't do that without our partners. So I'll, um, this will be one of probably several times I'll give a shout out to all our partners um, who make this uh, map possible. So um, we've got folks from the estuary program, the counties, um, all, all over really that are going out and collecting Secchi disc uh, measurements almost on a dear, near daily basis during that period in order to uh, get uh, an idea of what the clarity looks like before we actually send the plane up in the air. Now these images too are collected specifically for the purpose of, of uh, mapping seagrass. So there's a lot of post-processing that goes into that. So once the aircraft flies, collects the image, uh, which is a digital image. There's a, a digital camera, about a one foot pixel resolution image that's collected from the, the aircraft at an altitude of about 9,000 feet. Then those images are post-processed. So there's a lot of color balancing that happens, pixel stretching, edge matching, a bunch of stuff that has to happen in order to bring out the bottom signature because that's what we're ultimately mapping. And then at the end of that post-processing, um, we have a mosaic. So we take all those individual image, what we call image strips, and we stitch them together and we create a, an image mosaic for each of those estuarine regions that you saw in the previous slide. Now I talked a little bit about field verification. This is a really important part of our mapping process and it occurs really throughout the life cycle of, of a, a map. So there's three types of field verification that we do. There's the photo interpreter ground truth. There's what we call the quality control spot checks. And then we have an independent accuracy assessment. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail. I'm happy to talk to, to you folks offline if you're more if you want more information or interested in our field verification process. But um, just know that it, it's a very involved process. And uh, with the photo interpreters going out on the boats, looking, what they're trying to do is basically address specific questions that they have on the signatures. So once the, the photos are are collected 
post-process and the PI start looking at them, they'll have questions uh, on some of the signatures that they're looking at. There's also areas that we know are gonna be problematic like passes. Passes are always a problem because there's a lot of sediment transport that comes back and forth in those passes. And so we know that the signature is gonna be probably obscured because of all the sediments. So those are areas that we typically know we're gonna to have to go visit and verify what, what the PIs are seeing. Um, this mapping cycle in 2020, about 903 points were, uh, were visited by the PIs across the, the Sun Coast, or from Tampa Bay down to Charlotte Harbor. Um, we have uh, gone digital completely for all three of these field verification phases where we're using an app called Survey123. It's an ESRI ArcGIS app that you can load on your phone, on your tablet. And so that standardizes kind of the data collection that we're all doing when we go out in the field. And it, and it also provides us with a, an instant point measurement. And then all that data gets uploaded to uh, a central database where the PA, PIs can actually look at that data as it's being collected. So it's a really cool addition this year. And we, we've kind of converted everything to it. So no more clipboards and, and pencils and papers, and then having to go back and, and kind of you know fat finger it into a computer. It's all done in the field. The other thing that's really important to note here, as well as the other two uh, types of field verification is that we've been doing uh, underwater video logs, which has been really cool. We've taken basically a GoPro camera, we mount it either on a pole or on a sled, depending on the total depth of the water, and we collect underwater video. Um, for these 903 points, the PIs collected uh, video logs at each one of those points. And what they actually did was go back to the office, look at those videos, and, and then make their uh, assessments based on the video. So it was a really neat way to do that. Plus it creates a, a permanent library of what these locations look like. So for future generations, they can go back and look at the videos and see what these places actually look like. Uh, we did the same thing with our QC spot checks. <clears throat> the difference between this and the previous um, <clears throat> type of field verification is this is kind of led by the district. So this is us <clears throat> going out in the field really towards the end of the mapping cycle. So we've got a draft map in hand, and uh, we're going out in the field to check some areas to make sure that um, these areas are, in fact, what they are. We do this a lot with our partners. So we've gone out with the estuary program with Sarasota County. Uh, we've been out with um, the Aquatic Preserve staff down in Charlotte Harbor, a bunch of people to, to kind of leverage the local expertise for folks that are like literally on the water every day and go out to areas that, that they have questions on as well. So we're working collaboratively with our partners on this type of field verification. And then the last one is the independent accuracy assessment. Now this is independent, which means we have a completely different team that's working on the assessment. And in this case, it was Wood. And I think Kevin Shelton's on uh, in the at the meeting today. So um, Kevin was the PM for this, this part, um, which is designed to basically put a, a final accuracy on the maps before we release them to the public. And so we collected over 1,200 points across the entire mapped area this year or this past year. Um, the data are collected at or shortly after the time of acquisition, which was very challenging given uh, the COVID pandemic and being able to figure out a way to get people safely out in the field. Nevertheless, Wood was able to pull it together and they actually finished all their field data a little bit later than we had anticipated around May of 2020. But um, it, was, it was a really Herculean effort to get all these points uh, collected. Once they're collected, then we wait for the draft or the preliminary maps to come out, which they did a few months ago. And then we use the data that were collected during this assessment to uh, make a final uh, accuracy acceptance uh, before we approve the map. So 90% across uh, the map is what we're looking for in order to say, okay, this map, uh, you know, it, it jives with what we're seeing in the field. So those are kind of the three ways that we field verify the maps. But ultimately the maps are made based on what we call photo interpretation. So again, remember you're taking a picture from 9,000 feet and you're looking at that picture and you're drawing these lines that you see on the screen based on that signature. Um, it's a combination, of course, of that and the field verification that I just talked about. The way we do this is we, we use what's, what's uh, kind of a modified flux convention. And I'm gonna go through that real quick. 
um, we, we map more than just these three mapping conventions, but for the, the sake of this meeting and for simplicity, and because this is ultimately a seagrass map, I wanted to focus on the seagrass portion. So there are, are two main flux codes that we use for seagrass. One is continuous and one is patchy. And again, it's based on the signature. Um, the other one that I, I'm going to talk a bit about because we're in Tampa Bay is this 9121 category, which is attached algae. So the picture you see on the right is chlorpyr proliferans. And so when you think attached algae in Tampa Bay, think these guys. So this is chlorpa. It's an attached macroalgae, which is different from drift algae that you see like Gracilaria, some of the lingbia that we're seeing down in the lower parts of Tampa Bay. Um, chlorpa proliferans has hold fast, and so they're able to attach themselves to the, to the substrate. And that's going to be important in a, in a few minutes here. But what I wanted to really stress to you guys too is that these, these seagrass categories are based on signature. So that again, the PIs are looking at the photo and they're seeing a signature and they're saying this based on their expertise, based on their experience and based on the field verification, they're saying this is a continuous seagrass bed. But what does that really mean to those of us who are actually in the water? It can mean a lot of different things. So typically, uh, when you think of a continuous seagrass bed, you're thinking of the picture on the top right. Nice, thick thalassia bed. You know, I guess there's a little syringodium mixed in there. Really nice, healthy bed. And that certainly is an example of a continuous bed. But remember, it's based on signature. It's not based on quality of grass. So really, any one of these pictures that you see would qualify as a 9116 continuous seagrass uh, category. So just keep that in mind. So when you're when I show you the maps for, for Tampa Bay and you see these nice bright green areas, don't necessarily think they look like the top right. They could look like any one of these. That's the same with the patchy, the 9113, which is the signature that, um, again, can be anything from a nice patch like you see on the top right to something on the bottom left. And that's a really important a distinction, uh, especially this year, because we've seen so much uh, macroalgae um, in places more, more so in the south, like in Charlotte Harbor, Lemon Bay, Sarasota Bay. But even if there's a lot of algae in there, if there's a signature that shows a patchy uh, area of seagrass within that algae, it could still be mapped as patchy seagrass. So don't think that it's not either or, it's not seagrass or algae. It can be a continuum um, until you reach a certain threshold, which in this case would be a 25%. So if you're looking at an image and you see patches of grass and these patches represent less than 25% of the area you're looking at, then it would be patchy. But that doesn't mean that there's bright sand within the patches. It could be something like the bottom left where you have a lot of algae. And then the last category we're going to cover today is attached algae. So this is that 9121. The reason why this is important will be clear in a few minutes. But again, in Tampa Bay, when you're thinking about attached algae, think of the picture on the left. That's a chlorophyll proliferans bed. And there is a very distinct signature difference between that and seagrass. So the PIs can, can pick up the difference between an attached algae bed and a seagrass bed. The one in the middle is just a different type of chlorpa. It's also found in Tampa Bay. They're not as common as proliferans. And then the one on the right is really, uh, it's a, it's a chlorpa called fastigiata, which is actually more uh, relevant in Charlotte Harbor than it is in Tampa Bay. All right, so that's kind of a, a high level whirlwind tour of how we make the maps. Um, and now I'm gonna go ahead and go into the results. Before I do that, I just wanna remind everybody, when you look at these numbers, these numbers represent the seagrass acreage totals as it looked between the months of November 2019 and February 2020. So we call these 2020 results, but they're really uh, based on imagery that was collected in the winter of 1920. So just keep that in mind. And I, and I say that because, um, especially for Lower Tampa Bay, I know we're gonna be talking about Piney Point, these results uh, happened way before anything uh, related to Piney Point. So this is just an overview of what, of what we call the Suncoast region, the results across the region. Um, Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, Tampa Bay, south to Charlotte Harbor. And you can see that really across the board, um, we saw 
losses of seagrass. So we, we've seen um, seagrass loss that's relatively minor in Clearwater Harbor, St. Joseph Sound, and then it, it kind of gets, gets higher as you go south with Charlotte Harbor seeing a change of about 23% or about 4,400 acres between 2018 and 2020. So when we talk about seagrass acres change, we're talking about the change between the 18 mapping cycle and the 2020 mapping cycle. But I wanted to show you guys kind of an overview of where Tampa Bay sits in terms of acreage change uh, across all the estuaries in the Sun Coast. Now we're going to kind of go specifically into uh, Tampa Bay and look at Tampa Bay specifically. Um, and what we see here is the 2018 map. So this is kind of just to re-familiarize yourself with what the seagrass map looked like in 2018. We had about 40,652 acres. You can see the bottom right graphic showing you where uh, that is relative to the rest of the um, seagrass mapping efforts that we did back to 1988. So we were, we were pretty, pretty much at a near record high. The, the high uh, happened in 2016. We saw a little bit of a decline in 18, but overall, you know, still sitting way over uh, 40,000 acres. Now, pay attention to uh, what happens to these green polygons, especially in old Tampa Bay. We're gonna go to 2020. Do you see that? So we'll go 18, 20. In 2020, as you saw in the previous table, we saw a drop, a uh, pretty significant drop uh, of seagrass to about 34,200, 300 acres. Um, that represents a pretty significant drop. It's about a 16% loss overall. But if we look at where those losses really happen, what you see is that the majority of that loss occurs in Old Tampa Bay. And if you look at the table, you can see Old Tampa Bay about a 38% loss. So that's over 4,000 acres of seagrass lost from 18 to 20. Hillsborough Bay had a, a significant percent change. So about 627 acres, uh, which was a 43% loss. But because overall Hillsborough Bay has less seagrass, um, it, didn't, it didn't affect the overall totals. But for Hillsborough Bay, for that segment, that was a pretty significant loss. Um, we also looked at the Manatee River with a 21% loss, again, only 149 acres, which is significant for the Manatee River Bay segment, but overall represents a relatively uh, minor loss. So what I want to do is really focus in on Old Tampa Bay and talk about this shift. So again, the, the left hand uh, panel is the 2020 grass map showing you the green and the, the darker green and the light green are the 9116 and 9113 classifications. So it, regardless of whether you call it continuous or patch, or I'm sorry, yeah, continuous or patchy seagrass, it's still seagrass. So if you see darker green or lighter green, that's grass. That bluish color that you see on the right represents that 9121 classification um, scheme, which is the attached algae. So that's these guys, this picture on the right, that's that color of proliferance. So what you can see from this table is essentially, um, almost a one-for-one one swap. So where you lost seagrass, you lost in Old Tampa Bay about 4,000 acres, you gained about the same amount of attached algae, that corporate proliferance. So it's not that necessarily we saw just a loss of grass. We saw a shift in the habitat type in a lot of these areas confined largely to the area north of the Howard Franklin. So the, what we call the hump, that area of Feather Sound, up into Safety Harbor, and then across Old Tampa Bay uh, near Channel A, and that area uh, in the northwestern corner of Old Tampa Bay, we saw this, this transition um, from seagrass to Calarpa proliferans, or generically attached algae. Um, so that's a really important thing. And, and you know the causes and the reasons and, and the implications from an ecological standpoint are still being discussed. Um, this is this is a subject of a lot of discussion. So <clears throat> I don't have answers to what the whys and the and the what's in the hows, but <clears throat> what this does indicate is that we have seen a shift in Old Tampa Bay from largely seagrass to uh, attached algae. Now the other thing to point out is we're looking at this as a, as a in a snapshot from 18 to 20. So 2018, November to February, so really November 17 to February 18, and then November 19 to February 20, so two, two snapshots in time. 
But what's important to, to realize is that it's, again, just going back to those conventions, it's not that in 18 you had all seagrass and then in 20 you had all algae. It's a gradual transition. And what you're looking at here is sort of a time series of photographs that were taken for our seagrass maps from 2008, 10, 14, 16, 18, and 20. And what you're looking at is these dark circles. These dark circles, these little, little tiny dots, almost like somebody took a pen and just kind of put these little green dots in 08, represents these very small calorifer uh, beds. In 2010, you can see them starting to expand. The lighter stuff that what you might look at in 2008 and say, well, that's sand. A lot of that lighter kind of grayish green stuff is seagrass. So that would have been mapped as probably patchy in 2008. And you can see it's changing over to algae in 10. In 2014, you kind of have a mix of, of uh, algae and grass. And then in 16, it looks like you're shifting back to grass. In 18, it's again uh, a little bit of a mix of both. And then in 20, it's almost all calorba proliferance. There's still grass out there, but it's less than that 10% threshold where if, if the grass is below 10%, we can't see it from 9,000 feet in the air. So it's, it's mapped as 9121 as that calerpa, even though we know there's probably grass there. But the point of the slide is really to show that there's a transition. It, it kind of moves from, from one end to the other, but there's a, there's a whole uh, spectrum of, of transition between calerpa and what's mostly Halliduli seagrass. Um, and this, these pictures are taken in Feather Sound. So this is right along the hump. Um, I mentioned the importance of field verification. And um, this is a, a graphic showing you uh, the, the seagrass transects that uh, have been, some of them have been going on since the mid seventies. And that red line represents one of the fixed seagrass transects that are managed by the Tampa Bay Estuary Program across the Feather Sound hump that we call, we call it the hump. And um, the graphic below here is showing you um, what the results of those uh, seagrass transect data are from 17 to 2020. Now, again, you know, timing is everything. And so the seagrass transect data are collected in the late summer, early fall. So let's figure out September timeframe on average. We fly in the winter. So the, the line that you see with a little airplane is the approximate time that we fly and then the other line with all the circles are the data from the transects. And if you look at the color changes, you can see in 2017, most of the data that were collected along the transect were seagrass, mostly Halliduli, some syringodium, you know, towards the 2000 meter mark, which is pretty far out in the, uh, on the transect. In 2018, you started seeing more calerpa come in. So these purple circles are the calerpa proliferans that attached algae I was showing you. And so it started to come in. This jives very nicely with those photos we just saw. And then in, by 2019, about three quarters of that transect was mostly calerpa with seagrass only in the most shallow areas from about zero to, I don't know, 700 meters. So somewhere around this area here. Um, that was in 2019. And in 2020, the entire transect was essentially calerpa. And so what, what that does is it gives us confidence that what we're seeing from 9,000 feet is being verified by these transects. So this underscores two things. One, that it's really important to have that field verification data. And two, these transects are hugely important. So um, you know whatever we need to do to continue to fund this work has to happen because these transects really give us a much more in-depth detailed view of what's actually happening um, that you just don't get at 9,000 feet. So we were, we were very pleased to see um, that these two data sources corroborated very nicely. So in summary, um, between 18 and 20, Tampa Bay lost about 16% of its grass. Uh, that, that translates to about 6,000 acres of habitat. Um, the 2020 map seagrass acreage dropped to about a 10 year low. So what does that mean? That means we're basically back to where we were in 2010. Um, Old Tampa Bay is certainly the segment that has been driving that trend for the most part with about a 38% decline. Um, but because Old Tampa Bay has so much mapped seagrass, um, that 38% decline uh, really affected the overall total for the Bay. 
Again, Hillsborough Bay did also report uh, a pretty significant loss, although from a magnitude standpoint, it's relatively small. Uh, you know, when you look at it bay wide, but for Hillsborough Bay itself, 627 acre uh, loss between 2018 and 2020 is significant. And then, you know, I guess the, the one sign of good news here is that um, in the lower portion of Tampa Bay, so Boca Ciega, Terracilla, Lower Tampa Bay, we, we basically had uh, very similar conditions to what we saw in 2018. So minor losses, you know, anything really under four or 5% is approaching the noise level of the map itself. Um, so, uh, you know, if you're if if you're around four percent, yeah, that's minor, not not something to be too concerned about. And the lower Tampa Bay essentially was unchanged. Um, I think the percent, the actual percent change was like 0.8 percent. So anything you know at or below one percent is is no change. So that's that's a little bit of good news. And and you know, having been out in Lower Tampa Bay quite a bit. Yeah, we're seeing some issues with some algae more recently, and and you know there are issues with drift algae, but uh, the grasses by and large are, are doing doing fairly well compared to some of the other segments of Tampa Bay. So um, I again can't thank uh, all our partners enough. Um, this is obviously not an in inclusive list of all the the folks that are involved in making these seagrass maps a reality. But I do want to thank uh, everybody for all the hard work that they've done in, in helping us make uh, the best map that we can. Um, these maps are now final. So those numbers are final. The maps have been released. And if you'd like to get uh, a copy of those maps, um, you can download the data from our open data portal. That's the uh, link to get to our open data portal. And uh, you can download the maps either as shapefiles, CVS, uh, JSONs, uh, there's a couple of other formats as well. And we are working on, uh, we're pretty close to releasing uh, PDF versions of each of the estuaries so that if you don't want to actually download the data and put it into GIS or some other viewer, uh, you can just download a, a, a finished PDF product and then you can have the map that way as well. Um, one really quick next step, we are gearing up for the FY22 maps, which uh, the flight window for 22 begins November of this year. So we're only a few months away from uh, getting back up in the air and taking pictures for the 22 maps. So um, I'll probably be calling on several of you to help uh, go out and collect Secchi disc measurements for that effort as well. And of course, if you have any questions at all, this is my contact information. I'm happy to talk offline. Uh, with you further uh, on anything that I've discussed or any other questions that you might have. So again, thank you very much for your time and uh, we'll see what uh, FY22 brings. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. Uh, does anyone have some questions they'd like to ask Chris now while he's here? I, I have a question. Okay, Ann. Um, so, Chris, now that we have this data, you know, you guys are the scientists, you get the data and then you start to think about what it means. Um, you know, what does it mean? <laughs> you know, what, it, what, it, what are you going to, how are you going to use this to make management recommendations? And what are you thinking about in terms of management recommendations that you might make? Yeah, so I mean, that's a great question. And the reason why we even do these maps is for that very reason, in order to track the overall health of the bay. You know, seagrass are, are sensitive to water quality conditions. And so they, they are, are a really good indicator. They're, they're sort of the canaries in the estuary, so to speak. Um, that being said, are they the, the only indicator? No, they're not, but they, they are a good indicator of the overall condition of the estuary. And what is what these maps are showing and, and the kind of the message that we're, you know, we're trying, we're, the message that we're sending out is exactly what these maps are supposed to do, which is there's something going on and we need to do something about it. First of all, we need to understand what's going on. And, you know, that's something that is being done actively right now primarily through the estuary programs and the technical advisory committees and subcommittees. Um, all Tampa Bay, as you, as you saw, is, is really, I, I guess, for lack of a better term, a hotspot for seagrass loss. But we also know all Tampa Bay has had some issues with water quality over the last several years. 
So the old Tampa Bay Working Group is working on trying to understand what's going on and ultimately what to do about it. I don't have an answer as to what to do about it, but I, I can tell you we're actively engaged with um, the resource management and the scientific community at large, not only in Tampa Bay, but this has actually expanded out to uh, conversations with folks uh, on the East Coast as well, with the Indian River Lagoon, and now more recently with Biscayne Bay, and leveraging some of the experiences that they have and some of the issues they have. Not the same, perhaps similar issues, but the way they're addressing it and the management actions that they're implementing, I think we can learn a great deal about their experiences in those systems as well and see how we can apply that to here. So um, short answer, I don't have uh, a short answer, but we are definitely engaged uh, as a community to try to figure out what to do about it. And I, this is Maya with the Tampa Bay Estuary Program. Um, I just wanted to build on Chris's response. Um, you know, through the Nitrogen Management Consortium, we've been sort of seeing periodic non-attainment of water quality standards in Old Tampa Bay. So we've known this is a potential issue and this is really, you know, a piece of evidence that we've been needing to see um, that the that the seagrass resources are responding to these poorer water quality conditions. And we think that this is really connected to those summertime blooms of pyridinium bahamens in that bay segment. And so we've been working, like Chris mentioned, the old Tampa Bay working group. Um, but we, we basically are at a point where we need to begin to consider management options. And so we've put together um, causeway modifications to improve circulation in that bay segment. Uh, we're looking at um, some of those large flood control structures um, that are delivering significant freshwater flow, oftentimes with uh, high nutrient concentrations during that wet weather time of year that are potentially exacerbating and providing um, food for pyridinium. And then we're also exploring um, the potential to use restoration aquaculture. So we've been partnering with the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, um, doing experiments to see if we can use bivalves like clams and oysters to um, selectively feed on pyridinium to basically short circuit their life cycle. So, you know, to consume them before they produce those resting cysts, um, which form sort of a seed bank that, that fuels those future blooms, especially if there are additional nutrients in the water for them to capitalize on. Um, so we've got a few options that are out there for the community to consider. Um, and so it's going to be time to start picking and choosing um, how many, if not all, of those options we want to begin investment. And we're sort of at that point in the management where uh, there's no, you know, one option, no silver bullet. We're going to have to do a lot of different things, and and none of them are that cheap anymore. So I've been kind of making the round, saying it's time to renew our commitment to a healthy Tampa Bay. And, um, and I think that's where we are, particularly in old Tampa Bay. Do you have any other question, Anne? That was a, that was a great question. That kind of yeah. covered a lot of the questions I had. Anybody else have something they'd like to ask Chris? There, wa there was a question in the chat about the PDFs being georeferenced. Um, I am looking at creating what I don't know those of you who know what a geopdf is um I, I think this we can is probably, David right uh I, I'm not sure oh I'm sorry it was a direct message to me so anyway I, I'll just I'll just tell everybody that you know if you are interested in geopdf we're looking at possibly using uh geopdf to produce the kind of the maps you can download and, and print out or put on your tablet Basically what that is, is it's like GIS light. You can turn layers on and off. So if you have all of the flux codes there, you can turn them on and off on a PDF. So anybody can do it. You don't have to have ArcGIS or anything like that. It's, it's kind of a neat feature. Um, but if, you, if you're interested in using um, the maps in a GIS environment, um, then I would say, you know, just go ahead and download the, the shape files from the website. Okay, thank you. Are there any other questions before we move on? 
Well, Chris, thank you. That was an outstanding presentation. Will you keep us plugged in as to uh, what you're doing and if there's anything yes. any of us can be doing to be supportive of you? Absolutely, yeah. And, and again, I appreciate those of you who have helped out in the past. I'll be coming, uh, looking for you very soon for the next seagrass map uh, round coming up. Yeah, we'll keep in touch with Alana because I'm sure she can, she's, she's really working on getting this network uh, in close communication. Great. So thanks again, Chris. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, um, we have next on our agenda an opportunity to learn some more about the Piney Point monitoring efforts. And Ed, uh, you're going to be leading this presentation. And then I understand after your presentation, there's going to be a discussion. A yeah, thank you. So if you would please pick up on yep. this. Yep, do you all see my screen now? Yes, sir. And is it in slideshow mode yet? Oh, there it goes. Yep, so, I see it. Excellent. So uh, I think it was great that Chris went first and kind of explained where we're at in terms of uh, seagrass recovery in Tampa Bay, because I think that plays a big um, uh, part of sort of the conversations we're going to have around Piney Point. Uh, up until about March 2021, you know, our focus has been on understanding what's going on in Old Tampa Bay. We've been recognizing we've had poor water quality conditions in there and, and trending seagrass losses uh, since pretty much the 2016 assessment period. So as Maya mentioned, you know, there's a variety of different management actions that we are encouraging the community to parse, pursue. And as I mentioned, up until March 2021, our focus and resources were dedicated uh, towards a lot of the issues centered around Old Tampa Bay. You know, that all changed uh, uh, with regards to the Piney Point incident. And that's what I'll kind of be giving an overview of, of some of the recent observations that we've been able to garner and some of the monitoring effort of the community in response to the event. Um, I start with this slide just to remind uh, everyone in the room that has been part of the, the recovery of Tampa Bay. This didn't happen overnight. You know, this was a 30, 40 year process of, of restoring Tampa Bay and it came at a significant cost to the community and investments made by both uh, public and private interests. And you know, the focus has always been on reducing the amount or the mass of nutrients flowing into Tampa Bay so that we have clean water for the benefit of, of restoring seagrasses. Um, you know, we have some estimates that are probably uh, underestimates of the total amount of, of, of money invested into reducing nutrient loads to Tampa Bay over the 92 to 2017 period, over that 30 year period, um, you know, that we've, we've been managing Tampa Bay as the Tampa Bay Estuary Program, and it's well in excess of probably about two and a half billion dollars invested in the Bay's restoration. And as you heard through Chris's talk and, and what Maya explained, you know, our focus now is not squandering that investment. You know, we reached uh, the restoration goal for the Bay back in 2014. We peaked in terms of seagrass resources in 2016. And now we're seeing um, sort of the early warning signs that we shouldn't be resting on our laurels. Um, as Maya mentioned, we need to make a renewed commitment to managing the mass or the nutrient loads going to Tampa Bay. Uh, across all sources. Um, and again, you know, our particular efforts were centered in Old Tampa Bay and you know, the Piney Point uh, uh, events are really diverting and diffusing those efforts that really need to be centered in, in that problem child base segment. Um, so big picture, you know, just to summarize it, uh, looking at the graph on the left from the 1970s to now, we've reduced the amount, that mass of nutrients flowing into Tampa Bay and the mix of sources have changed a, a whole lot since the, the 1970s, those bad old days. Uh, as a result of that reduction in mass of nutrients, you know, the water quality has gotten better. Uh, it's, it's pretty evident in lower Tampa Bay up until this past year that we had extremely clear waters and the seagrasses have loved that. Uh, the seagrasses have proliferated. And now we're trying to understand what's going on in terms of Old Tampa Bay, which we think is still a nutrient related issue, but it's also being exasperated by uh, patterns of circulation and uh, residence times of that water uh, up in Old Tampa Bay. Um, the effort, again, hasn't 
come from just one uh, program. It hasn't been the SRA program. It's been the collection of municipalities and agencies represented in uh, the room today and the agency in Bay Management, as well as the SRA program, the Regional Planning Council Board. Uh, they basically bought into the idea of the controlling that, that total loading to Tampa Bay um, back to uh, levels that would allow adequate water quality to persist in all the base segments. So in a sense, we, we developed uh, speed limits for each of the base segments. You know, these, there, there are limits to the amount of nutrients that each of the base segments can assimilate without there being sort of adverse cascading ecological effects, namely poor water quality, the loss of seagrasses, and then everything associated with that loss of seagrasses. So we did this, you know, quite some time ago, and we've established these speed limits. And I, I highlight on the left the, the speed limit that has been established in lower Tampa Bay and highlighting the Piney Point facility, uh, you know, the piece of the pie that's attributed to that uh, one facility in terms of its contribution of nutrient loads to the Bay to maintain a healthy water quality condition in lower Tampa Bay. And their allocation, basically their piece of the pie is 0.9 tons per year. And that I've referenced that just because that, We'll put into context sort of the, the, the events that unfolded after um, the emergency discharges that began in, in late March and early April. Um, you know, we routinely track the, the Bay water, Bay's water quality condition, as, as Maya alluded to, and we know that we've been seeing signs of poor water quality in Old Tampa Bay. We certainly are starting to see signs of poor water quality conditions in Lower Tampa Bay now with this additional nutrient load, and it, it's a you know, we are pretty much in the throes still of the response of what the, the ecological ramifications might be for that mass of and release of nutrients into the lower and middle Tampa Bay regions of, of Tampa Bay. Um, another thing, just to put things in perspective, these graphs show the historic estimates of total uh, nutrient uh, nitrogen loads going into each of the base segments. The one graphic, uh, uh, the fourth one down is Lower Tampa Bay, and pretty much I just want to draw your attention to since about 2004-2005 time period, the loads, the total amount of load going into Lower Tampa Bay has pretty much been at or below 200 tons per year uh, since about 2005. And the bulk of that loading has come from atmospheric sources, not from point sources or stormwater sources to that base segment. Um, so when we have an acute discharge event like this that really exasperates that total load to the bay, we know that we're going to have ecological ramifications for that bay segment. And, and that's really what, um, you know, we anticipated at, at the onset of, uh, you know, the discharges, uh, unmitigated discharges to lower Tampa Bay from about March 29th to April 9th. Uh, there was about 215 million gallons of this mix of process and seawater that was discharged directly in the bay. And we estimate, you know, that was somewhere in the order of about 205 tons of nitrogen uh, in, into that bay segment over a 10 day period. And as I alluded to in the graphic uh, in the previous slide, you know, we typically don't see that amount of nutrients flowing into lower Tampa Bay uh, over an entire year. Uh, it's usually less than that. And we saw that over a 10-day period. So we know that, you know, these cascading ecological impacts from that mass of nutrients flowing into uh, lower Tampa Bay are, is going to have an effect. We knew it wasn't going to happen right away. Uh, nutrients don't act like typical uh, contaminants. They're, they're not really toxic to uh, seagrass or phytoplankton, but we know it would stimulate production of, of algal biomass in some way in the lower uh, part of the bay and where, where the plume and trajectory of this discharge uh, might impact along the coast. And that has really been, um, you know, the community level response that has been elicited uh, since that uh, March time period, you know, there's been a rapid mobilization and uh, need to collect additional information on the conditions of the bay uh, prior to the anticipated impacts from those discharges. On the right, I show you a graphic from the University of South Florida's o Ocean Circulation Group. They've been doing a great job of providing forecasts of where that initial discharge might be impacting uh, portions of Tampa Bay and now along our coastal beaches. Um, I do want to just mention, you know, the colors on there are a little bit uh, misleading uh, in terms of uh, the potential 
anticipated concentrations that are lingering in uh, some of these areas. So it's, it's basically a, a logarithmic scale. Uh, some of those green teal colors are a, anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 fold decrease in concentrations of initial discharges. But again, when I talk about mass of, a, of nutrients going in the bay, that mass of nutrients is now uh, suspected to be impacting all the waters you see shaded here in color. So again, the, the immediate concern was how um, this was going to stimulate algal production and potentially cause some shading effects on, on sensitive seagrass areas, namely those Cockroach Bay and Terracea Bay Aquatic Preserves that are in and around the Port Manatee Discharge Site. And then some of these longer term impacts of, of, of that shading effect and potential crashes of these algal blooms in terms of, of poor water quality conditions that might have broader fish and wildlife impacts. And, and that has really been the focus and effort of the community. Um, luckily, we have a robust uh, um, monitoring program established by uh, Pinellas Manatee uh, EPC. We have, uh, in some cases, data sets going back to the 1970s of monthly water quality observations. So this has really been instrumental in understanding what uh, the potential water quality impacts uh, could be from this, this initial discharge event uh, with relying on those, those long-term data collections to see what um, any new data collected over the next couple months might be in terms of anomalies. Um, you know, other information that we, we didn't have readily available to us was, you know, you know long-term records of algal seagrass, particularly macroalgal abundance in some of these sensitive shallow water habitats. And as I mentioned, the community has quickly mobilized and uh, started to acquire some of that information so that we can actually make some um, you know, uh, assertions on what the potential impacts might be uh, from this discharge. So I'm gonna transition now. You guys still see my screen and the, the uh, website, the Piney Point Environmental Multi-Monitoring Dashboard. So, from about the end of March to early April, we the estuary program in partnership with all the monitoring partners who are providing data to this board, we basically built this from the ground up uh, to understand what the impact could be. And it's been really useful to put into context sort of the observations in terms of the initial water quality conditions uh, in the bay. And there's a bunch of different ways you could visualize uh, what the impacts could be. Um, I'm taking to you to the water quality page and uh, on the initial display, what it is showing is ammonium concentrations from all these different sites. Uh, if I turn off any land-based sites and just look at what was collected in the water column and constrain it to the early weeks, both prior to the initial discharge, I could also emphasize what are considered out of normal range by clicking this other toggle. So, you know, prior to the initial discharges, there were some data collections and most of the ammonium concentrations were in line with background concentrations uh, that were um, collected from that baseline period going all the way back in some cases in the 1970s for some of these stations. So when we start making those comparisons to that long-term record, we could, we could start seeing when the anomalies start occurring. And as I shift the slider over, you start seeing the weekly collections that's, you know, on the onset of the initial discharge, we got expected high concentrations of, of, of ammonium in the bay proper in around Port Manatee uh, that has that spread through time um, into areas of lower Tampa Bay. But through April, you know, the, the concentration signal has been diluted. That doesn't mean to say that, as I mentioned, the mass, the total amount of nutrients in the bay isn't having an impact. So we know that 200 tons of nitrogen is going somewhere. And what we, what we found out, I think initially from both water quality monitoring and, and satellite imagery is that, you know, we've seen these cycles of algal blooms um, that first occurred, you know, shortly after uh, the discharge event occurred right off of Port Manatee. So we saw some diatom blooms in and around the Port Manatee discharge site. And then progressively through time, we're still seeing, you know, higher than normal 
chlorophyll A conditions in this part of lower Tampa Bay relative to the baseline data that has been collected historically in this base segment. So this tool is it's fairly useful in sort of visualizing what the results are gonna be um, in terms of the water quality conditions, but we also pro provide you know, synthesis of some of the algal surveys that are, are starting um, to be had from all these water quality collection efforts. And, you, and as we know, and as we've heard, you know, we've, we've seen both macro, macroalgae blooms of Lingbia, um, in some cases, some trichodesmium blooms along the beaches in, in early to late May. And now, uh, since about April, an intensification of, of red tide, uh, both in lower Tampa Bay and now along our beaches. So again, that mass of nutrients that was introduced into, um, you know, Tampa Bay proper or now is impacting the near shore coastal environments is having potentially these cascading uh, effects on, on the phytoplankton macroalgae response in this portion of the bay. And that, again, is, is what our main concerns are in tracking this through time. We've been providing uh, summaries on the results on a, on a month end basis in terms of the changing conditions that have been observed. Um, we put out an initial summary, just summarizing all the different entities that have been contributing to this effort, basically on top of uh, you know, what they're already doing in terms of the ambient monitoring programs or enhanced efforts that weren't occurring in, in uh, this portion of Tampa Bay. So it's been a host of both private consultants, university groups, the counties that have been doing the steadfast monitoring in Tampa Bay uh, over decades and uh, various other nonprofits that are just making general observations of the base conditions as, as this, this response unfolds. Um, so again, we knew we, we were not going to see an immediate re response. This is gonna be something that cascades through the environment over weeks and months ahead. And what the long-term impacts are going to be are, are still uh, you know, a concern for the, the overall management of the Bay. And where our focus should have been, as, as I mentioned, was in you know, areas of Old Tampa Bay where we've know, known we've had some long-term issues. And now you know, our shift in focus is now towards responding to this Piney Point event. Our shift in resources are, are potentially being uh, diverted to this potential issue uh, where we should be addressing these you know, lingering uh, and longer term impacts of seagrass resources in Old Tampa Bay. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll summarize all the lessons learned. You know, we know, you know, Piney Point has been a sore thumb. Um, this has not been the first uh, uh, event, uh, unmitigated release of, of nutrients and processed water into uh, the Tampa Bay system. We know in those prior events that we've had nuisance and, and, and in some case, large algal blooms that have resulted from those release of, of, of nutrients from that process water. Uh, up until the March event, you know, the, the facility closures were estimated, the full facility closure was estimated to be probably between 10 to 20 million, depending on um, how uh, that, that remaining wastewater burden was gonna be uh, handled on site. Now, after this has become an emergency event, you know, we're probably going to, uh, spend in excess of $100 million just to fully close out this facility. So, you know, the cost of, of being reactive rather than proactive in terms of fully closing out uh, facilities like this uh, is something that we need to have a community conversation about. Um, and, you know, just to reiterate what I started with, you know, we have spent a significant amount of resources trying to get the Bay back on track. Uh, you know, events like this, you know, these acute events like this are not uncommon in terms of creating a tipping point for systems. You just have to look across uh, the state and look at Indian River Lagoon and what happened there. Uh, one significant wintertime event really set the stage for um, these cascading ecological impacts that are now resulting in potentially mass mortality events for manatee because they don't have the seagrass resources to feed on uh, in that system. So we definitely don't want to repeat the mistakes um, that and some of the lessons learned in other areas. And a lot of that requires us to, to look at, you know, being proactive in our monitoring effort. We know we have significant gaps in terms of supporting real-time monitoring uh, in our estuary. We are 
an estuary of national significance, although we do not we do not have the monitoring resources or assets that other systems in the state are are receiving funding for towards uh, to understand sort of uh, these um, both wa uh, water quality conditions and the ecology of the bay. We have continually put, put in our, our comprehensive management plan the need to continue to support the port system, which has been instrumental for port navigation so that we don't have oil spills or other uh, potential impacts. And that has a need for, uh, for continued funding. That system has been instrumental in, 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 in understanding the, the circulation patterns from those initial discharge events. And we don't have significant long-term investments towards these, these monitoring assets that are giving us conditions in real time. And we are one of the uh, largest open water estuaries on the Gulf Coast, and those resources are not being expended. And, you know, again, this, this serves as that sort of warning sign and, and, and bellwether event that, you know, we don't want to be or contributing to a tipping point. We know we have a warming climate. We know that nutrients are the contaminant of primary concern for the Tampa Bay estuary. And as we trigger these events, we know we're going to have, in terms of cascading uh, ecological impacts, and they're manifesting now in terms of uh, persistent red tide blooms. We just had a significant event in 2017 and 19 uh, that have all sorts of both environmental and economic impacts to the region. We're now in 2021 and potentially setting ourselves up to repeat uh, sort of that, th those events with the intensification of red tide. Uh, now in Tampa Bay and along our, our coastal beaches. So I, I created that preamble sort of set this, the stage for some of the discussions that I know I don't have all the answers to. Um, again, you know, our efforts have been focused on understanding what the, the interim and long-term impacts of, the, of this acute discharge event will be for the Bay's ecology and our continued recovery of Tampa Bay. But there's also questions that need to be asked. What needs to be done now in terms of fully closing out that facility? How quickly? Uh, what is going to be any potential quality of that discharge um, into Tampa Bay once the, once the facility is completely closed out? Um, could we be doing something now with the algal biomass that is in the bay to reduce sort of these cycles of, of boom and bust of, of algal production that we're now observing? That uh, in my opinion, probably was uh, somewhat seeded in terms of that initial discharge from the March-April event. And how will the continued closure of, of that facility and any additional discharges uh, contribute to um, the Bay's uh, longer term uh, response and hopefully, you know, resilience to this acute event. So, you know, the, all these discussions still need to be had. Uh, we are still in the throes of the response of, of the Bay to uh, this discharge event. And there are certainly a number of other uh, facilities within the watershed where, you know, events like this have happened in the past. Uh, and uh, there's the potential threat for them to happen in the future. And how we manage those systems moving forward uh, with, again, the, the recognition that nutrient loading to Tampa Bay is the one number one contaminant that we've been managing over decades of time. Uh, we have to have a renewed call and renewed effort to uh, look at what's going to be best for the Bay moving forward. And events like this certainly aren't helping, um, you know, the needed effort to restore some of the, the lost seagrass areas in old Tampa Bay when we're scattering resources and scattering needed monitoring resources towards these acute events. So I'll stop there, um, get off my soapbox for a little bit, but in, in, enjoy any conversations we would have around these topics. Um, Ed, that's um, very compelling, your presentation. <clears throat> I understand that uh, we've made arrangements here to have you be joined by Dr. Mark Rains with the DEP and Rob Brown, who's with Manatee Division Manager of their County Parks and Natural Resources. Is that correct? I believe so. Yeah, I think they're both available. Um, okay. On the call. If so you, maybe if you wouldn't mind kind of coordinating that, Ed, I'm sure there's some questions or that some of our group 
may want to raise with you. And I'm just looking at this and I'm gonna interject myself right now. I'd like to hear from everybody else, but I think this would certainly be a project where we might want to have one of our subcommittees take it on and come up with some broader base support for you to deal with some of these issues. It's appalling to me, frankly. But anyway, um, Ed, if you would continue with your panel, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, had I'm 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 here mostly to address any questions on in terms of the monitoring response. <clears throat> um, I know there's been additional discussion dialogue about doing something now. We know we have pretty significant rafts of lingvia blooms uh, in the Anna Maria Sound region. Uh, in the Manatee River and areas outside of uh, Joe Island. Um, you know, there's been discussion of, you know, mobilizing uh, cleanup similar to what was done in terms of the red tide event back in, in 2018 and 19. The sort of cost benefits surrounding doing something like that now and, and particularly in the, the sensitive seagrass areas, I think is a conversation that needs to be had, but I, I, I believe there's resources available if, uh, we want to potentially pursue that option of, of trying to get these nutrients um, out of the system so that uh, they're not continuing to contribute towards, you know, a worse summertime condition further down the road. Okay. So we, we are joined by Dr. Mark Raines. Um, do you want to introduce yourself, uh, Dr. Raines? And then we also have Rob Brown on, on, the, on the call, and he is a member of APM. So if you want to introduce yourself as well, Rob, that would be great. Yeah, thanks, Alana. So, uh, oh, wait. Yeah, yeah, you can hear me. Uh, uh, my name is Mark Raines. I'm a professor of geology at the University of South Florida. Um, I'm also currently uh, the chief science officer for the state of Florida. Um, uh, my first day on the job was April Fool's Day, and I began it at Piney Point. Um, and I've spent a lot of my time since that time uh, there, including I was just there yesterday with... Um, or two days ago with the incoming um, interim secretary, Sean Hamilton, as he was touring both the Bay and, and the site. So I, I, I do have, I mean, Ed just did a great job of sort of bringing us up to date. Um, if you're interested, I could um, uh, tell you where we are relative to um, site management and where um, we're, we're trying to, to to push the system towards in the future. So, I'll, but I'll, again, I'm here at your pleasure. So I'll, I'll, I'll just sort of await your questions and prompts and I'll, I'll turn it over to Rob to introduce himself now. Thanks, Mark. Uh, yeah, Rob Brown, Manatee County, um, Parks and Natural Resources, Environmental Protection. Um, yeah, just here to provide support. Um, we've been actively involved um, and personally, I've been actively involved in the site for the last 30 years. Um, so I do have a um, kind of historic perspective, um, actually going through some of the notes recently, um, um, looking at a December 1st, uh, 2001 uh, ABM presentation from um, the event that happened uh, following Tropical Storm Gabrielle when they released um, about 300 and, well, it was, it was about 15 million, 18 million gallons. Um, was the beginning of that event from 2001, 2002, uh, which you again, as Ed alluded to, we saw a uh, response. Um, that discharge went through the outfall 001 to 03 uh, directly into um, Bishop Harbor. Um, and we saw a uh, ulva macroalgae bloom first uh, there. And um, then later, later we saw a similar uh, limbia bloom in the Manatee River um, following that as well. So um, again, we're here to provide any historical perspective or what activities that we're conducting with the rest of the group um, today. Um, um, do we, do you um, have any uh, opportunity to respond from the perspective of Manatee County, your your policymakers, what what would they like to see happen, or what have they discussed? Well, again, since um, 2001, uh, it's been our desire to see that facility closed completely, um, and 
at I think you're a little low on your estimates um, back in 2001, 2002, the, the first attempt of the closure is over 170 million uh, invested. So, um, you know, there's there's quite a bit invested in the early phases. Uh, the effort wasn't completed and and hopefully this time there will be some commitment to fully close this facility. Um, and also, as you know, Ed had mentioned, uh, we'll, um, we're having discussions with the um, uh, county administrator this afternoon with uh, um, Dave Tomasco, the Sarasota Bay executive director, uh, to look at the possibility of, of doing exactly what, uh, uh, what Ed suggested is what kind of opportunities do we have to extract some of this macroalgae from the system? Um, not it's it's not an easy endeavor. Uh, we've attempt, you know before the red tide collecting fish is one thing, but I remember collecting um, ulva in Bishop Harbor, which is a very shallow estuary. Um, it's it's really difficult. Um, it, the material is very wet, slimy, breaks apart. Um, we don't want to be spreading this material around farther than what it is. Um, you have to provide areas for staging to dewater and then ultimately find a, you know, either um, take this material to a landfill or somehow figure out how to recycle the material. So we're, we're going to be talking logistics today to see if we can um, start that endeavor. Okay. Mark, do you have a perspective you'd like to share? Yeah, and I saw um, Ann has a question in the chat about a, a plan, and I, I can sort of speak to that, I think. So the, um, first of all, as Rob, you know, points out, this goes back to 2001, there was an event in 2011, now 2021. I don't think any of us want to be sitting here in 2031 having the same conversation. So the Rue DeSantis has been very clear, he would like to move towards full closure. Um, our past secretary, Noah Valenstein, who, whose term ended last Friday, very consistently um, moving towards uh, full closure and interim uh, secretary Sean Hamilton, as I said, who began on Monday um, uh, is, is saying the same thing. And I think exemplifying his focus on it by spending a second day on the job at, at Piney Point and then Wednesday meeting with um, Scott Hopes and others um, to, to continue the conversation. Um, closure means a lot of things to a lot of people. Uh, I think what it means to the state is uh, all the water drained, the reservoirs um, filled in, the site recontoured, the site um, restored, and then the site managed for stormwater in perpetuity, like real, like it's done, um, so that we don't have to confront this problem again. Um, there are a lot of options for how to get rid of that water, some not so good and some also not so good. Like there's, there's, not, there's no easy way to do this. Um, but I think that the, the one, and we can go back and talk about the various um, uh, proposals if you'd like, but I think the injection well is uh, on site is, is perhaps um, the, 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 the leading candidate now. So you treat the water on site, inject it down uh, about 3,500 feet to the formation. Um, that's not fast. Uh, if, if, in a normal circumstance, you might think 18 to 24 months before the pump starts running. As Rob says, there's a bunch of work that was done previously. A lot of the, the exploration, exploration drilling has been done. Um, uh, but still, there's a bunch of that that's not controlled um, by, say, the state. Um, the land is currently owned by HRK. They may not want to put an injection well on their site. And that's their prerogative. So there has to be some, some conversations about uh, transfer of ownership for an on-site uh, well. And then on the back end, there would also be complications relative to drilling itself. There aren't a lot of drill rigs that can drill a well to this depth. Um, there certainly isn't one parked and idling in Palmetto that's just waiting for, for, for uh, someone to flip a switch. Um, but that notwithstanding, uh, uh, we, we believe we can shorten that timeline through uh, applying pressure and facilitating uh, a, a lot of the things that need to be done. Um, in the meantime, the state is uh, propped up two on-site treatment companies um, that are treating the water on site. Um, you know, they're getting water that may be as high as 230 milligrams per liter total nitrogen, 160 milligrams per liter uh, total phosphorus, which if you know your numbers is staggering, um, but they're having a lot of success. They're consistently treating 
to below four milligrams per liter total nitrogen and, and well below one milligram per liter total phosphorus. Currently, they're just circulating that water on site. It's not being discharged. Um, but the, it's important to re remember that this started with a breach in, in the uh, MGS South Reservoir and that breach exists. It's been uh, repaired, um, but the repairs uh, are not certified for completely refilling the reservoir. Um, and so there may be a need in the interim while we move towards a permanent plan that um, treated water might need to be discharged again. Um, and um, we're trying to be as open and transparent about that as possible, but HRK may be forced into a position where their third party engineers will not certify holding any more water on site. And there may have to be releases. Um, states promise to stay in touch with all the stakeholders and get everybody as much notice as possible. Um, um, we would be mobilizing our own resources to, to, to monitor in the Bay as well. So um, it certainly wouldn't come as a surprise or, or, or any kind of a secret. Um, uh, so that's the state of play right now. I, I think everybody's on the same page. We just need to keep our foot on the gas and make sure. I mean, there's, as Rob said, you know, we've talked about closure in the past. We've made significant progress toward it. Toward it. And for whatever reasons, um, we haven't closed the deal. So I think this time it just requires all the stakeholders to keep foot on the gas and, and keep us moving uh, collectively towards closure. Mark, just one follow up on that. So I know we've had conversations, the emergency order has now lapsed. So HRK is now officially back in charge and operating the site. Any um, discharges that would occur, they would still need to run by the state or is it just managing the yeah, facility the at this point? Yeah, the fucking bullshit. I'm so over it. I like... Uh, so, uh, yeah, yeah, no, they, they, they still have to coordinate with it. Like, so they have resumed ownership. HRK has resumed, I guess they never stopped owning it. They've always owned it. The state has never owned it. Um, just to be clear, this, this, but under the emergency order, the state could, could, could make some decisions that lapsed, um, is that this Wednesday or last Wednesday? Anyway, it's lapsed. The emergency order lapsed and they, they have not only ownership, but they have management responsibilities again, but they have to manage it under guidance uh, put in place by the DEP. Um, and so um, that, that, that guidance may um, uh, require that they um, uh, uh, discharge at some point. So though they, though they have full management capacity, it's under um, orders. In the meantime, there's discussions about um, um, putting it into receivership so that the, a receiver could manage it. And I don't know exactly where those are in the, in the, in the state of play, but um, 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 trying to, to sort of give us all a sort of a, a more firm say in, in if and how discharges happen. Because right now it would be HRK's decision under the order that they're operating. Mark, um, you say that, you know, the state doesn't own it. And, and are you saying that the company that does own it is bankrupt? I don't know what they're, I, to be honest, Barbara, I, I can't answer that. That would be sort of beyond my capacity. Um, uh, uh, all I know is that um, HRK owns, and as of the expiration of the emergency order, is in full operation of the facility, but again, operating under um, orders issued by the TEP relative to human health and safety, which, and those may, you know, again, because the, the base problem is that the NGS South Reservoir has a, a, a pretty sizable leak in it. And the repairs um, that have been put in place um, have, have stopped that leak, but so too has lowering the head. That was, that was why there was the emergency discharges was trying to bring the pressure down in that reservoir. Um, with the uh, repairs back in place, the, the, there's two third-party engineers that, that um, consult on that site, um, Wood and Artemon, and they both have certified under emergency conditions for reservoir, that NGS South to take on more water, but it's emergency only. They really don't want uh, to rely upon that as a water management strategy. So right now, water's sort of being circulated on site balancing it in all the various stormwater ponds and reservoirs. Um, 
Um, but it's about to start raining substantially, and it's unclear if we're going to have a big year or a small year. And, and um, in any case, there, there, there certainly may come a time when those third-party engineers may um, say that they'd like to see water discharged from the site. And, and um, again, the, 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 if, if that's done and it's done in a controlled manner, then it all goes through treatment first. Right, in which case it's coming out at you know four milligrams per liter or better total nitrogen, one milligram per liter or better total phosphorus, um, um, and that gets us away from the uh, uncontrolled discharges of the emergency order, which was pushing water out at 230 milligrams per liter total nitrogen and 160 milligrams per liter total phosphorus. So um, lower volumes at much lower concentrations um, uh, would be uh, our near-term future. Um, but of course, the long-term future is moving towards an injection well or some other such permanent solution that just rids us of this problem um, in perpetuity. So I want to bring this back to the role of the agency on bay management. And I think you've said a couple of important things, Mark. Um, that, that all of the solutions to permanently close this facility are very costly um, and that we've sort of tried to do it before and we haven't uh, been able to, to close the loop. And I guess my hypothesis on part of why that is is because of another point you made, which is all of the closure options, like none of them are really attractive. You know, that we're, picking, we're picking amongst, um, you know, not great options and that's sort of a recipe for inaction. So. I think that the agency on bay management has been an important voice and advocate, particularly um, you know, rallying elected officials and the public. And so to me, you know, I hear you and I hear Manatee County getting behind, you know, fully treating this wastewater and then putting it into a, a UIC well, so injecting it into the aquifer. And we know that while as experts, we might be on board with that, there are some, some reservations amongst the general public. And the Absolutely. agency on bay management can be very important and helpful in, in helping getting folks on the same page about why that's the best option. Because if we don't make some choice like that, the default choice is that we're choosing to continue to put this water back into surface water bodies, namely Tampa Bay, and that that's wholly unacceptable. So to me, that's an important place for the agency on bay management to weigh in and be a strong voice in the community to help um, help us rally that part of the Thank community. You. Thank you very much, because that was the thought that was going through several of our minds, that there must be something that we can do to be supportive and I'd ask you, um, Alana, if maybe we could put together a little subcommittee to come up with some strategies to be supportive of Manatee County. I also personally think that there ought to be some responsibility, and I'm sure there has been discussion with the owners of this facility for contributing to getting this thing resolved. It shouldn't just be up to the, the state or the federal government and in the process, perhaps we ought to be looking in other areas of the state to see if we have similar problems that are just sitting in the background waiting to pop up on us. And that's a question that's being asked in the chat by both Steve Swanson and Renee Brown. Um, what's the next piney point and what can we do as this group and other to get in front of issues? Okay, can you uh, give us some input from your perspective, Mr. Manatee County? Yes, um, actually <laughs> just, uh, Again, I've got my own notes here. Back in 2001, the um, ABM actually created a Piney Point Task Force. Uh -huh. um, and the task force was uh, put together to, again, look for potential remedies. But also, there was a me uh, memo dated January 7, 2002, to the, to the legislators with all three local counties, um, to the state and so forth, um, providing um, some, some insight, some input, um, some conditions and some, you know, some concerns that the agency and their and their partners had. Um, so, I mean, to me, that might be an option. And not again, this Piney Point is not the last facility within Tampa Bay that needs to be managed in the future. So, there's a possibility that this task force could look at the other ones as well. Okay, um, Alana, if you could be looking at putting something together and and consult. Uh, with our manatee friends to see 
what we can do as an agency to um, mitigate this issue because it's very significant. And as someone in the general public and having been a former county commissioner, I know the concerns for water with uh, drilling. There's also the concern, well, will you pollute the aquifer? We don't wanna do that either. So we've got to find a good solution or solutions, but definitely address it. We can't run away from it. And with this rainy season coming up, it's gonna be a problem. Do you agree with that, Maya? Yeah. Okay. I see a question from Ann in the chat that maybe I'll answer. She's asking, has offshore water discharge been considered? And the answer is yes, Ann, um, that uh, you, know, you could pump water. You, you say, how about a pipe? But the, probably easier is, is currently the pipe extends to Port Manatee. So you could put uh, tankers in Port Manatee. You could fill them with the water. You could drive it out to the middle of the Gulf and you could dump it. It's been done in the past, um, uh, but it's, it, it, you know, there's a lot of logistical problems with it. The first one being tankers don't want to do this. Like they don't, that's not, that's not something they want done with their tankers. Um, it would be costly. It would be time consuming. Um, it would tie up the port in ways that maybe the port doesn't particularly want to be tied up. Um, and then there's always the, the issue of not being permitted to do it. I mean, the federal agencies might just say, like there's a zero chance you can't do that. So, um, so it, that that's certainly been considered, and I, I think still is being considered. Um, but you know, as I'd said, and Maya sort of reiterated, there's we're just choosing from a whole lot of cruddy solutions. Um, another one that's been on the table, by the way, and if, if you haven't asked about it yet, you might is is RO. Why not put an RO facility? And that's under consideration too. But remember that RO doesn't make it all go away. It results in a concentrate, um, and that and that's a significant concentrate when you're talking about 500 million gallons of water to begin with. So now you've got a, 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 a the same load basically, just in a more concentrated form, and you still have to do something with that load. So um, you know they're just we we a lot of ideas being kicked around, but I want to reiterate something else. Maya said the lack of a plan is in fact a plan. Um, that's right. And, and, and so if, if, if we fail to galvanize around whatever cruddy plan we think is most palatable, then we are choosing a different plan, which is to revisit this again in 2031. Um, Mark, and um, Mark, I, don't, I don't think any of us want to be here again. No, we do. We do, um, as we were reminded, have had a former work done on this that we can resurrect and see what they decided we also, um, as Alana mentioned earlier, when she was setting up the different committees, we have a legislative committee and this may require legislation to, because we can do all the studies in the world and we know there's a problem, but just monitoring isn't gonna be enough. We've gotta do something. Um, Shannon from the um, DP in the chat said that she's able to provide um, some more information and context on the other facilities in the state. Um, Good. Shannon, do you want to unmute yourself? Sure. Um, so I, I, I saw that someone had asked, like, what's the next Piney Point? Um, Piney Point is the only facility that is not managed by an active phosphate company in Florida. All other sites are accounted for and are being actively managed by the operators who have demonstrated their financial assurance to the state. Um, that's, you know, required by Florida Administrative Code 62-673. Um, and there are stringent regulations in place to ensure that there are adequate storage levels and ensure proper and safe water management at those sites. So in that respect, Piney Point is, is unique in and of itself. It sure is. Okay, well, thanks for that information. And Alana, please follow up with Shannon as we put our task force or our committee together on this. We are gonna do something. We can't just sit around and look at it. And gentlemen, thank you for your presentations. Is there anyone else that would like to comment or ask a question on this issue? Okay. Again, thank you all for these presentations. Very, very important and very interesting. And please keep us in touch on a regular basis with what you're doing. Uh, don't have to wait till the next meeting. Alana's there and she can take your information and share it with us as we 
uh, going along with our activities. Is there um, at this point in time, I, I don't think that we've got anything else coming up, do we? Alana? Yeah, we have a presentation from uh, Bruce Hasbrook from about the Wheaton Island uh, Restoration Project. Oh my goodness, project. one of the most important ones, <laughs> Bruce. Would you please proceed to share with us what your data is on, on Wheaton Island? You're doing the mosquito ditches and the spoil mounds and so on. Would you please let us know what's going on? Sure, I'd love to. It's always great to follow up some of these uh, semi less than positive presentations with restoration <laughs> projects. We're doing. Good. Good. All righty. So it is, it's the Wheaton Island Preserve. We're doing a wet, uh, pilot project for wetland restoration. And it's a, a cooperative funding uh, initiative with Swift Mud in Pinellas County. We are looking at the 2012 uh, management plan to make sure we match the goals and objectives of that plan. We previously did a feasibility study to look at different uh, habitat and enhancement projects and looked at both existing and proposed site conditions and permittability. And of course, the most important one, the uh, measurable benefits for the cost. Uh, quickly, Weed Island Preserve is a 3,100 3, acre preserve. We studied 1,100 uh, pretty much right around the, the center. The mangrove forest is the dominant. And there are also some significant cultural and historical resources present that we uh, looked at during the feasibility study. Uh, the key issue is the mosquito ditching. So you can see on the left in the 1943 prior to ditching, uh, the 58 scars that were left from the very poorly uh, executed effort. And then a little bit more zooming in during the 70s. So these things don't go away, don't go away. Um, again, we ran through the feasibility study to look at both the habitat restoration. Uh, we looked at exotic and invasive species management control and then hydrologic restoration, uh, looking at water quality and circulation. So a lot of people see the uh, better parts of Weed Island. We've been through the canoe trails and additionally, there has been a little bit of previous restoration effort out there, removal of the spoil mounds, and they were able to uh, create some pretty nice, unique saltern habitat. So we looked at three things, the spoil mound removal, the new species removal, and then the hydrology improvements. improvements. And traditionally, a lot of the spoil mound removal throughout the state has been using hydroblasting, so it's a method of using pressurized water to uh, blast away the mound. Uh, typically does require some follow-up as well as a uh, removal of the new species prior to. And then the, uh, it's been a little bit mixed in the results. The methodology has um, uh, had some issues with the material removed and the elevation remaining as well as the type of soil remaining. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's pretty unique and it did have quite a bit of, uh, of uh, benefit. But we looked at a more uh, aggressive measure. It's, we called it WIDO, to walk in and dig out. Um, this is one of the machines that we're thinking about doing. These are bad boys here, uh, very unique. And the idea is that they have diesel motors in each of the pontoons that actually drives the machine. So there's not any issues with the salt water or the Brazilian pepper branches or anything fouling the equipment. And they have an extremely low uh, footprint. So they're very accessible. Um, and the idea is essentially to walk in uh, using the spoil mounds to create access, also to fill the ditches. And then as we dig out, we'll be uh, hauling away some of the material. Uh, there's similar efforts, a really um, successful one was in the uh, Mosquito Lagoon and Indian River Lagoon. Indian, um, 
Those were a little different than what we have, but this is what you see from the St. John's Water Management. And there's the results. Um, they kept their costs extremely low because they were able to use district staff. Uh, they used no survey, so they had uh, people that were fully aware of the proper mangrove habitat. Uh, they did not haul any material away, and they were able to restore 40% uh, of their uh, wetland acreage. acreage. Um, our, our sites are a little different. You can see the spoil mounds um, and then a lot of adjacent black mangrove habitat. So really our goal is to remove those mounds and get them down to down uh, uh, suitable or similar elevation. And most of these areas within the preserve are surrounded by uh, mangroves. Uh, mangrove. We do have some erosion issues. You can see the uh, mounds are starting to erode. Many have been there 70 years. And then we start seeing issues with, as the erosion occurs, it's filling in the ditches and it's affecting the hydrology. hydrology. Uh, so we did look for the mosquito ditches to, um, we have three approaches, either filling them, excavating slash dredging, and then desilting. Silting. And um, you start to see some pretty interesting things when you get out there and go through every single ditch. There's 43 ditch segments within our project area. And there's the whole variety of colors. Uh, typically it's uh, highly anoxic and it's a result of, uh, you're seeing the bacterial result from the- it's 11 uh, o'clock. From the issues in the water. All right, so we came up with a preliminary concept um, looking at removing the mounds to create temporary access roads using the big uh, long reach from the dredgers to reach across and dig out some of the mounds. And then we're going to look at um, restoring the ditches. So data collection, uh, again, this is an extremely challenging aspect. We didn't want to send surveyors out to collect all the data. So we decided to go ahead and use LIDAR. So LIDAR is the light detection and ranging, which uh, uses light pulses to measure elevations from aerials. And as you can imagine, if you have coverage from mangroves and other um, trees and things, you get quite a bit of uh, low data. So we used all the data for everything above elevation zero, but more aptly elevation one, to uh, identify all the mounds and collect actual data as far as uh, elevations and quantity of material. Quantity. We also put uh, boots in the water. Um, I really have to Hat, hat off to the staff that went out and did this. Extremely difficult. Uh, in many cases, we actually found muck as deep as 36 inches that you have to slog through each of the ditch segments. But we collected the salinity, dissolved oxygen, temperature, also noted the uh, water color. Then we measured the width in three locations, uh, measured the water depth, measured the muck depth, and then some other anecdotal information, such as one thing we started noticing were the presence, absence of oysters were a very good indicator of circulation. Of circulation. Again, uh, this is not easy work, and we literally went to every literally went to segment for the data collection. So we created some GIS graphics um, to you know, the ditches, the 43 segments are shown on the left. Uh, the right, you can see the, um, the width. Then some other interesting information. We looked at the much muck depth, which uh, corresponded very closely with the distance away from Masters Bayou, where the, uh, the liveaboards boards are hanging out there. And then DO was also one that was a fairly good indicator of circulation. All right, so we did a charrette. Uh, for those that don't know, charrette is French for cart. Uh, very quickly, where it originated was uh, in architecture. 
So let's say the local vicar, vicar uh, came to his local architect team and said he'd like to have a new church. Um, each of the architects did quick sketches. They passed the cart around, they threw their sketches in the cart, and then they carried it up to the front of the room and each of the individuals described what they thought they heard the vicar say. And then the goal was that you would get the best element out of each of the person's individual ideas. So in our charrette, we had an introduction. We talked about the data collection and uh, showed some of the results of that. Um, then we broke away for 20 minutes and did an online survey where each person voted on the approach that they wanted for the ditches. And then we returned for the discussion. So here's the uh, online survey that each person took. Uh, they identified whether to dredge, fill, or desilt each of the ditches. And then here was the results. We did have some people that did it collaboratively, sat uh, several of them to come up with the results, but we ended up with uh, some pretty interesting approaches as far as uh, the different approach for each of the ditches. Wow. So uh, the next goal was then to develop the plans. So we have uh, plans where we identify each of the ditches. We've made a determination of that whether we want to fill them. Uh, and again, filling them is an arbitrary term because we're going to fill it to elevation 1.0, which is a, a good black mangrove elevation. So it doesn't affect the sheet flow across the area, but it doesn't allow for any more channelization. Uh, we're dredging to make sure that we have good connections to Masters Bayou. And then the desilting is the ones where we have good ditch depth, but there's a lot of uh, uh, silt in the bottom of those ditches. Some of the, uh, we are identifying each of the spoil mounds to be removed. So those will be uh, dug out and either used to fill the ditches or hauled away. And then we've identified the temporary access roads that'll allow the contractor to get in and do the work. So as you see, most of the roads, all the roads are intended to be on top of the spoil mounds and those will minimize the temporary impacts. Uh, we do have several um, tools in our toolbox to assist that such as temporary crossings to maintain flow when they're crossing over good ditches, as well as the use of crane mats and geotextiles so that whenever they're digging out, so they put the textile down or the crane mats, uh, create the access road. And then as they're backing out of the area, then they'll dig it down to elevation one. And um, we're anticipating within the first seed set in October that we'll get a, a large coverage of uh, seed source because of the, the very extensive um, black mangrove community that's out there. So our schedule, we're 100% for the design plans by October 21. Uh, we're currently underway in the permitting process. Then the county will do the bidding uh, between December 21 and June 22. And then we've given the contractor a pretty wide window for construction. Um, our main goal is to not have them in there in the rainy season and to try to get a lot of their work done in the dry season, but to be finished um, late summer in 23, so that when we get the uh, seed set, uh, we have the proper areas and proper hydrology for the seeds to uh, recruit and restore the area. Uh, I've got quite a few stakeholders. Uh, of course, Pinellas County is the lead on it. Swift Mud's the cooperative funding. Uh, estuary program has been providing a lot of input as well as Regional Planning Council. We have uh, USGS AWARE. Uh, we've been working very closely with them to make sure we don't have any impacts to archeological resources. Uh, the Friends of Whedon Island, of course, are definitely on board and we're looking at potential opportunities to um, make sure the areas that are remain open for um, the kayak trail in the future. And then a portion of the Duke Power easement runs through the project. So we're working with them as far as access. And there are three um, box culverts to go under their alignment that they're interested in helping us clean out, desilt, and stabilize. 
And with that, I'll open up for questions. We have some questions. Please, please. Well, I think it's a great uh, initiative. I just wondered <laughs> um, from a, a lay person's point of view, who created these mosquito dishes to start with? Uh, the US Army Corps of Engineers was the one that um, contracted with the firms that went out and did the dredging around the state of Florida. I mean, is this a usual practice? Until they figured out it was the wrong thing to do and it didn't work. Yeah. <laughs> like, probably, it probably gave them additional breeding ground for the mosquitoes. Yes. Well, it's real interesting. I spent a lot of time flying around the state and Google to try to find um, unimpacted black mangrove habitat, especially in the West Coast with a similar setting. And mm -hmm. I did find a few areas down in Charlotte Harbor that um, we've been mimicking because one of the other things we're doing is putting a few meanders in the uh, ditches to try to uh, mimic what we're seeing in the unimpacted areas but there's a large part of, part of the state that just wore it out over time well i'm real proud of pinellas county for um, providing the leadership for this it's really a, a great project and a great thing to take over that is so rich in history what thousands of years so it's an environmental and historical treasure as well will you be providing this information to alana i'm assuming on our website so that we can anyone that wishes to access it can do that yes ma'am okay all of the and then presentations of course both. Okay. yes alana all of the presentations, um, our, our presenters sent to me ahead of time. So you can find those on our website. So if you just go to tbrpc.org slash ABM, and then on the left-hand column, you'll see a tab for meeting materials. Um, click on that, and then you can find all of the presentations there. Okay, is uh, Vicki Parsons with us? Is Vicki with us, Alana? Yeah, I see Vicki, you're, you're Vicky, muted. Vicki, you're muted. Mm -hmm. And you uh, turn on your speaker because we're going to ask Vicki. She's the editor for our Bay Soundings publication, and uh, I'd like to introduce her to you all. And I believe she's going to ask us uh, for some input on some future articles if she's there. Vicki, I am. Good. Now, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good deal. Um, most ABM meetings, we ask for thoughts on articles. Um, so I, I always walk out of ABM meetings with good ideas, but we want to kind of throw it out and say, what are we missing that would be of interest that I didn't know about and Alana didn't know about? Um, any thoughts on that? Well, um does anyone have a response to that question? I mean, this is an opportunity for you guys to be showcasing what you have in your area or your organization. Well, I think what we we'll do is, um, Vicki, is we will publicize this on our website and ask people who are members of this committee and Alana, if you could also follow up with an an email to everyone and ask, give them the information as to how to access uh, Vicki. What are your timelines, Vicki? Uh, not specific since we are now a virtual publication. So it's more along the lines of, of what happens and trying to get um, 16 stories in a, in a quarterly publication the way it was when we started. Okay. All right, so folks, we have a we have a question in the chat um, from Aaron. Do we, yeah, I don't have the chat up here, so please do let me know who is who's asking the question, Alana. Aaron Brown, um, he asked, "Are you covering the proposed fifty four extension through the Green Swamp?" I have not been, and the reason I haven't been is that the the whole 
thinking on base soundings was to cover things that mainstream media isn't covering. And it looks like the Times has been doing a good job on that, unless I'm missing something that I don't know about. I think that the good angle there, Vicki, is that we are now seeing, like, you know, once you get three of these kinds of things, it's a trend. We're seeing sites that were in some way, shape, or form kind of thought to be preserved or protected, and then they're coming under threat, and we're getting pressured to put public dollars toward them again to save them multiple times. And so I think you could tell this story in the context of some of the, the others that have been occurring, like the USF um, property on the Hillsborough River, you know, you could talk about it in the context of the, the Gladys Douglas Preserve and the, and the adjacent district property that was, um, you know, attempted to be surplused years ago, um, but now the it's going to get... The Saranova? Yeah, Saranova is another Saranova, good example. Yeah. I mean, we've had, we're having to double and triple expand our energy to protect properties that should already be protected. And exactly. really, I think the Habitat Master Plan has shown that we have a lot of work to do to expand beyond the footprint of what's already protected. So that'd be the angle I'd encourage you to take. And I don't think that's the story that any of the um, other large media outlets have done. I don't think anybody's connected those three. They're, they're such different projects, but certainly the same problem. Great idea, thank you. The excellent, Maya, and uh, Vicki also, some of the issues that we heard discussed in this meeting and prior meetings, I believe could be shared. Um, Aaron, Absolutely. Aaron, were you, I saw his light go on. Did you have a question or something you wanted to bring up? I just wanted to say that I, I think that's a, a great point that Maya brought up there. And, you know, as the entire world is focusing on rewilding and regreening. Here we have some of our most pristine and critical habitats that appear to be coming under just continuous threat due to our kind of rampant expansion uh, and development. So I just, I think that any, any opportunity to shed light on this issue or any readership is important at this point um, because it seemed like this was one case where it really kind of got a full head of steam before a lot of people were aware that it was even uh, a topic of conversation. So I just, that's kind of my two cents on it. No, that's good. It's worth more than two cents. And, and I think you're right on that. It was kind of, by the time anybody was paying attention to it, judging by what I'm reading in the times, it was nearly a done deal. Yeah. Anybody else? Yes, the phone with the phone number. I don't know who that is. So um, one of the things that I think we're, we're seeing now is that um, where in the past there were a lot of planning uh, modalities that were there. You know, we had uh, divisions within the state that really looked at these long-term planning projects and those have been um, dissolved over time. So, so now we don't get the planning for large scale efforts the way that we used to. So I think that's part of our problem, you know, um, I, and I, I think maybe there's a, 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 a way that this group could write in some kind of uh, recommendation that um, where large areas have been set aside for preservation that every effort should be made not to bisect them with any kind of uh, infrastructure uh, activity. Actually, that might be a good presentation at one of our future meetings as well. Very good point. Okay, anybody else have something they wanna add? Hey, yeah. Vicki, um, <clears throat> a possible just interesting feel-good story is I know Bach Tower Gardens, their rare plant conservation program is doing a big push the first week of July to reintroduce and plant a bunch of endangered species throughout Hillsborough and Pinellas County. Um, so I think they have a location each day and they're going in seed sowing or introducing um, some smaller plants to quite a few different areas. And I think they're doing at least two or three endangered species. Nice. 
Do so, you would each of you when you make <clears throat> these suggestions to Vicky, if there's any way you can actually contribute some information so she has something to start with, that would be great. Tiffany, I know you know a lot about things we don't know about and I've known Ann Paul for years and boy, she's got her fingers on all this stuff. So Ann, whatever you can send to Vicki would be helpful too. And any of the rest of you actually. Yep, I definitely can. And I plan on trying to at least go out one or two days so um, I can try and take pictures and stuff as well. Good, that'd be great. Good, anybody else wanna share a thought with Vicki while we have her here? Okay, Alana, can you think of, of anything else that Vicki needs to know about before we finish up our meeting? Um, it looks like Mark just unmuted himself. Yeah. Do you want to say something? I was just going to say we're getting ready to put in uh, an away, a wave gauge array up off of Philippi Park uh, in Safety Harbor as part of the Living Shoreline uh, project that the county is doing up there. So we hope to be doing that in the next week or two. Uh, depending on the weather and crew availability and that sort of thing. And that would be set up to, to kind of proof of concept on living shorelines are working as well as seawalls. Right. right. The idea okay. is to, they're going to replace about 2,600 feet of, of seawall with living shoreline. And so we want to get some before and after wave reflection data, see how well the living shorelines actually attenuate wave energy nice good good and then that with your black bear camera black bear camera who said that oh yeah <laughs> yeah there was a they closed the park down last week because there was a black bear wandering around it but he's he's moved on to other pastures well okay anybody else have anything they would like to suggest to vicky all right, then some of these ideas also might be incorporated for future meeting discussions, but does anyone have anything that they would like to see uh, brought to us? Well, what we can do is, of course, we want to have follow-ups on some of the discussions that we've had. And in the meantime, um, Alana has shared her contact information and We'll probably be calling some of you for follow up on your respective organizations or group that you represent, any things that you're doing, because we want these meetings to be fulfilling. Mark, we're sure going to want to know more from you. Did you have something else to add? No? Okay. Alana, is there anything else you want to bring up? No. Okay, well then i remind you, we have a meeting. When are, are, do you have any subcommittees meeting before a general meeting, Alana? So I need to still figure out when those will happen. Um, I was planning on having them before this meeting, but you know, with Piney Point happening, I just figured everyone's hands were, were tied. So um, after this meeting, you know, I'll reach out. I know summer is a bit tricky for people's schedules because everyone's taking vacations. So um, I was gonna shoot for probably like August. Um, I know our next meeting is in the beginning of uh, September, so um, I'll, I'll look at getting those uh, started and then obviously the, the Piney Point task force as well. Okay, and you all keep in touch uh, with Alana because she's going to want to know what's going on or what we need to be aware of. Our next meeting is scheduled for September the 9th, and Alana will be letting you know what's going on with any of the other ongoing activities at the same time. Is there anything anyone else would like to bring up before we close the meeting? I just wanted to remind everybody that the next Bay Area Scientific Information Symposium is scheduled to be in person in October from the 18th to the 22nd. And you have an opportunity to submit an abstract for a poster or oral presentation um, now through June 17th. So uh, visit tbep.org and submit those abstracts. Well, be sure to send that to um, Alana also so that we can share that with other people that might want to take advantage of that opportunity. Yeah, my, I can include that in the follow-up email after this meeting with the minutes. Um, if, and if, then, yeah. Just a reminder, the next, I don't know if this was said, but the next meeting we're looking at having that in person. Yes. Yeah, um, so with a hybrid option. 
And for those who absolutely can't make it, there will be virtual. But we hope to see all of you there. If nothing else needs to be discussed then, our meeting is adjourned and thank you all for attending and for participating. And thank you to our speakers for your wonderful presentations. See you later. Thank you all. Take care. Bye-bye.